All right. Now we're on to the next steps of your GM solid axle conversion using the solid axle conversion kit from TahoeOverlanding.com. If you're just now joining this video series, this is a step-by-step -step video series showing what needs to be done to install your Tahoe Overlanding solid axle conversion kit on your full-size GM. Stay tuned. In this video, we're going to show you the next steps on doing your Tahoe Overlanding solid axle swap in your GMT 400 or OBS Chevy. Uh, if you wanted to see what parts need to be unbolted and removed or what needs to be cut off the frame, check episodes one and two of this video series. Take a look, Tahoe Overlanding GMT 400 frame plates, specially made just for the GMT 400 and the Tahoe Overlanding axle swap. As you can see, you have to cut a notch out of this bulge and the frame kind of bulges right here. You have to cut that out and make this flat for the coil mounts. And these are shaped to take up all the material that's lost and weld in there to strengthen the uh, frame. And you can see these slots here. These are actually so that you can attach this frame plate to this edge of the frame, which would otherwise be flopping around or not really have any, any strength because it's got nothing anchored to it. So it's just a little bit extra strength to be added. Just like that. This one always triggers people, so I thought I'd do it again. What we've got there is a plank of wood and the coil springs being sandwiched between the plank of wood and the ground so that we can see what the coil springs will roughly compress to under the weight of the front of the vehicle so we have a good starting point on where to um, weld on the coil mounts to the frame. Now you don't actually need to do that, but I was doing it just because I could, and especially because if you look it's just barely off that lift arm. So if this thing were to fall at all, it's not falling far. And here's a couple of things you have to do every time you do a Tahoe overlanding axle swap. First, right here on the passenger side, directly up from the track bar mounting point, you need to notch this out. The track bar will hit if you don't, because we get more droop than this axle ever saw. And second, this sway bar mounting point needs to be chopped off. And the steering hits where that was. So you have to cut those two things before you do your Tahoe overlanding axle swap. And also when you're prepping your axle for your Tahoe overlanding axle swap, you need to do something about the slotted holes on the control arm mounting points on the lower control arm. Your radius arms are going to be adjustable. You don't need that tiny small amount of adjustment anyway. So what you need to do is something to lock out those slotted holes. And what I like to do is use these chromoly weld washers. They're a, a machined chromoly washer that you can weld on to get a nice round true bolting surface. So see there? Always want to run a bolt through them as you're welding them because you want to make sure that's what keeps them true to one another. Okay, so on the uh, GMT 400s, the GMT 900s, the heavy duty trucks, the frame is wider and this upper locating arm bracket that was originally on the Dodge interfered with the frame when the axle went all the way up, especially on the driver's side because the track bar has the axle come a little closer to the driver's side at full compression. So if you cut that off, you can use these Tahoe overlanding upper locating arm plates and weld them on right there. Now it's time to talk about how to set the 
uh, coil mounts and get everything mocked up. So we had already set the rear to the height it's going to be by installing a shackle flip that the customer wanted. We then measured from the fender lip down to the axle hub center on the rear. On this particular vehicle with the weight that he has loaded in the back for being how he's going to um, drive it with all the gear in the back, we got a measurement of 24 and 3 quarter inches. So we mock the axle in place at a position of 24 and 3 quarter inches to center. See right here? We also set the vehicle down on the coil springs to see how far they will compress roughly under the weight of the vehicle to get a starting point. We can then infer from right here where the coil springs mount up and set this distance so that we can weld these coil mounts on at least tack welded to get a rough starting point. And then when we have the radius arms at least built enough to hold the vehicle, we'll actually put the coil springs in and lower it down and see where it actually sits because things change. You know, geometry slightly changes the way springs compress, things like that. So this is just a starting point. So this has just got some really strong tack welds on both sides, strong enough that it can hold the weight of the vehicle, you know, temporarily, but not so strong that it'll be very hard to cut the tack welds and change the uh, height of the coil mounts if we need to, to make it where we want it to sit. All right, we're getting ready to tack weld on the coil mounts on this GMT 400 solid axle conversion. And this customer wants his uh, ride height to be just a little bit lower in the front. He's not going real big tires. And so you can see that we've actually raised the uh, coil mounts up on the frame about an inch. And the reason why that's um, important is because if you raise the coil mount up, then the ride height drops. If you drop the coil mount down, the ride height raises. So. We're going to tack weld these on and we're going to see if it sits where it should under its own weight and if it's good we'll full weld these to the frame if it's not we'll cut the tacks and move them okay so on the collector i've already unbolted the collector from there so now we're going to come back we're actually going to cut it way back here because we'll probably need to do some adjustment back here so i'm going to cut it right here at the uh, next uh, flange So we've already unbolted these bolts here on the um, actual rubber pushing, and I've actually jacked it up. It's supported here, as you can see from the transmission jack. Let's talk about why the GMT 400 cross member from Tahoe Overlanding is built the way it is. So having the cross member moved forward and holes drilled in here and attaching this to the cross member and instead of having your radius arm mounts you know up underneath you know does that make sense? Having it pushed back like this affords a couple of things. First things first when you put your yoke on for your slip yoke eliminator for your uh, front drive shaft it gets the drive shaft well clear of the cross member. If that cross member was moved this much further forward, when that drive shaft tries to droop out, sometimes it actually might interfere. Then you have to like start cutting the drive, cutting the uh, cross member and putting reliefs and things, introducing weakness. And your links would end up short because they would be further forward as well. And you do want your radius arm mounts to be closer to the center of the U joint, the center of the double carden joint on your drive shaft. So going backward with your link mounts is also more ideal. And third, that allows the link mounts to be further back and on the front of the cross member instead of hanging below. You know here at Tahoe Overlanding, we hate hanging link mounts below the frame level. We like ground clearance and break over angle and we like um, you know, not having your links hanging down to get bashed and hung up on things. So that is why this cross member is offered the way that it is. The Tahoe Overlanding cross member uh, does use material just like this rectangular tubing here and it comes with these mounts that are not attached yet when you get it and then you can adjust where they weld on side to side. So it sits like that. And the reason why that's necessary is that unlike other builds, we use a triangulated uh, radius arm design, which means the radius arms are on a little bit of a slant. And depending on how long your radius arms get, the distance between the two mounting points at the cross member changes. So you have to be able to determine where you're going to mount your axle and then decide where these need to go. So that's why we send them just like this. You can get them lined up 
Use a clamp, clamp these on, tack weld to make sure everything's good, full weld. The top overlanding cross member also bolts in from the sides, not just from the bottom, but from the sides as well. Okay, so just bolting into the bottom of the frame rail is not enough for a, a radius arm cross member. It's okay for a transmission cross member, but not for a radius arm cross member. So if you look, see right there, we've actually got a mark, and that's a scribe hole that we'll drill through and actually bolt to the side right there too. And get some additional strength. And that's going to keep the cross member from twisting this way and this way. You'll note that um, you will need to drill through the sides of the frame to attach those parts to get those uh, reinforcements. We also have the removable center section. And the reason why that's important is that, yes, your factory cross member did not have a removable center section because the whole factory cross member was designed to be removed in the event of dropping a transmission. You can see it there above me. That's the uh, Tahoe Overlanding cross member that's available for your GMT 400 Tahoe Overlanding axle swap. Ties into the frame from the side and the bottoms. Available separately outside of the uh, extended parts bundle from TahoeOverlanding.com. So now we've got the axle locked into place. I've actually used the 2x3, which is just a little bit narrower than the uh, link mount. So you see I've got a spacer up in there to tighten it up. And then it can go up and match the angle because there's a slight angle on this that tapers it inward towards the back. So now we can identify what angle needs to be back at the cross member. For the step of determining radius arm length, you need to actually have the axle jacked all the way up into the fully compressed position, not at ride height. Okay, so that's the axle jacked all the way upward as it's going to go, as far as we can get it. So now you will put the weld-in bushing in the axle end and the Johnny joint into the cross member end. About halfway through the adjustment of the Johnny joint, you see that's threaded on there, and you measure the distance that you'll need to cut the length of the tubing. I didn't catch it on camera, but you need to tack weld the outer bushing sleeve to the tubing for the radius arm but then remove it and get the bushings out of it to full weld it. You don't want those bushings to melt, so you have to take those out before you fully weld it and then put them back in for this next step. Okay. You take that, you're going to slip it on to the joint here. Same end. Okay. Let's get that stuck up in the axle. Sometimes you gotta wiggle it a little. Okay, now I've got it in. We're gonna start figuring out where things gotta go. I can get the axle set front to back, and I mean, I'm gonna measure from the body mount right to the edge of the axle and get it perfectly set before I tack weld that to make sure that it's in the exact spot I want it. When getting ready to make your upper locating arms, Measure from the center of the lower control arm bolt at the axle and make a mark 12 inches back on it. That's going to be the center bolt for your upper locating arm tabs. So now you've welded on the tabs on the radius arm side at 12 inches back. You will then use it to line up the upper locating arm tabs on the axle side to get the joint in there and weld those tabs on. You'll note that those tabs on the axle side will be twisted just ever so slightly inward so that it makes the joint neutral. And then you can measure between these two parts of the weld-in fittings to determine the length of tubing you'll need to cut down for your upper locating arms. It's important that you only tack weld in because you don't know for sure how long to make this until you've got the drive shaft in to determine the U-joint working angle at the pinion to be right around zero to one and a half degrees. So it's important to just tack weld it because if you need to change it, it's a lot easier than if you fully weld these. Be sure to check out the next video in the series to see the next step. We're gonna go through this step by step and show you every step you need to do.